Effortless Mindfulness with Locke Kelly. Experience support for awakening as the next stage of human development through micro-meditations and conversations about non-duality, neuroscience, and contemporary psychology. Today, I'm going to talk in depth and share about what I call effortless mindfulness awakening training, sometimes called effortless mindfulness awakening therapy, EMAT. So this is a full integrated way of including both science and meditation. We are going to discuss and discover ways to integrate psychology, spirituality, and consciousness in a way that makes for a holistic approach to shifting into the next stage of human development. The premise here is that most preliminary practices and most psychologies are really a way of just reorganizing the current constellation of consciousness, which is organized around a small self or our small mind or what's called parts-based identity and thought-based mind. The effortless mindfulness awakening training is a non-dual approach. And what does this mean? Well, it's not psychological only. It's not meditation only. It certainly is not just philosophy or what we would call the best of our educated mind. We have to shift out of this small identity and into the next already installed awake consciousness. So this is unique, and I'm going to try to, as experientially as I can, share this with you today. So you could say that in terms of developmental psychology, there are different models from a child who is dependent to becoming independent by moving from what Freud called primary process thinking, which is what a baby and a small child is operating from, and then developing secondary process thinking, which is conceptual thinking. There are other models like this. Daniel Kahneman talks about system one, which is internally automatic processes, and then developing a slower but more conceptual system two. So what we're going to discover is there's actually a system three, and not just primary process, secondary process thinking, but a third way of knowing. So this way of knowing is awareness-based, and it is also embodied. Non-duality means that there's both this relative reality that we know, but that there is also a dimension of awake consciousness, which is what most of the meditation masters and systems of meditation hold as their goal or their reason they start with these preliminary practices. So when we begin with our meditation, the first stage is often calming the mind through one-pointed attention, whether it's watching your breath, using a mantra, doing yoga practices of pranayama and asanas, which are body postures, and then concentration practice in yoga. This calms our secondary process thinking, our small mind, and then we're able to, if we continue, to discover our awake consciousness. The awake consciousness is, when it's in its fullness, 
it has an embodied quality, an interconnected quality, and a compassionate feeling toward ourselves and others, a naturally already here way of being and seeing. In terms of psychology, many of the views of our cultural understanding of interpreting psychology is that there's one ego, there's one sense of self, and we're trying to create this smarter, safer, happier me. Then there are the contemporary interpretations of spiritualities and even meditation systems that say, no, that's a false self. We've got to go beyond that self, or perhaps we have to realize there is no small self. It never was there. It's not who I am. Or we work with the emotions as if they're afflictive consciousness, and we try to transform them or replace them in cognitive, behavioral, or even mindfulness-based cognitive therapy to try to bring more positive, calmer sense of this self or go beyond it to no self. So what we're going to begin with is what many of the newer psychologies in the last 40 years or so see as the mind is multiple, and the other way to look at it is there are sub-personalities. So from even Freud, you could say that dividing the psyche into ego, id, and superego are really parts. And in fact, Freud said that you could imagine this like billiard balls, where the id as the primitive drives of a person to get what they want, kind of on an animal level, basic drives come up to try to sit in the seat of the ego, and then the superego tries to protect or defend against it and say, no, don't do that. And as if that billiard ball knocks the id out, and the key is to have the billiard ball of the ego to knock the other two out and become the center. So certainly there's a subpersonality based, parts based, that we're not just one thing, not just a self that is the whole personality that has feelings and emotions and stories that need to be changed or let go of or transformed. So the addition of this true self with a capital S or the not focusing on the sub-personalities, one of which is the ego or the ego manager, and finding this not that small self, not the small mind, to discover this already awake consciousness that is this third way of knowing, is this third operating system, is this way of going from dependence as a child to independence as a thinking, I think, therefore I am adult, to this awakening from that to interdependence, which is a kind of interconnection from more of the feeling of what you would feel when you're in flow consciousness, doing what you love in life. So this possibility is done through consciousness. So it's a little more like meditational process, though it interacts with the psyche or psychology. And we'll explore that today. So the direct practice of effortless mindfulness does not stop at the mindful witness, which can be a first move a first step to a neutral observer, a non-judgmental witness that is able to step above 
and observe the contents of consciousness coming and going, almost like a microscope, or at least detach from that attachment to any subpersonality. So there is a first view of something greater than that small self, and certainly the two first realizations that can happen from standard mindfulness practice is, I am not my thoughts. So when we're identified with our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, we feel like whichever is stronger feels like it is not only our thoughts, but our feelings, and then those feelings affect the nervous system, which sends cortisol and adrenaline to feel anxious or fearful or worried, and then it feels like our body and our mind are one. This must be who I am. I can't deny this. And it is happening at that level. Then the ability to step back in a calmer time, certainly, at first, is often easier to see, oh, that thought, I don't like what's going on. This person should do that. I should have done that, are seen, even though they start with I, are seen as thoughts occurring to who? To this non-judgmental, mindful witness. So we've shifted out of thought-based knowing to what I call the transitional subject, meaning we were this subject that was identified with thoughts, feelings, sensations, and this worldview that comes with that subpersonality, then if we're able to step back or up or out or ask for some space, find a view, which here is the consciousness move. So it's not a philosophical understanding it literally feels like there's some space or distance or perspective, a change of view. Where are you aware from is no longer within that blended or identified place where you can have polarized thoughts. I shouldn't be thinking this, you know, it's okay, I I need to do this, don't do that. Even that is within the, the stage of the mind where these Subpersonalities are coming to play out their parts on the self stage. This mindful move gives us this halfway move from being one of those subjects of the parts to being this neutral, non judgmental witness, which is not identified, but it also is not the superego, the judge, the critic the commentator, or even what's called metacognition, which is a way of getting some mental distance of being aware that you're having this feeling, being conscious that you're consciously overwhelmed, but even stepping beyond that, beyond even what's called self-awareness in psychology, which develops at one and a half to three years old, where you develop this noticeable, observable part in a child that can say, oh, I shouldn't touch the hot stove. Or it speaks saying, you shouldn't touch the hot stove to within that stage of the mind. And this part becomes that governor, which can be important in that secondary process thinking, and independence. But here we're even stepping one more move beyond to this transitional subject. So now we take ourselves to be this mindful witness. So the next move that we can do is either to drop within to the subtlest dimension of consciousness within, which then will open up out and be equally inside and out, or not just pull the witness consciousness back to a big sky mindful witness, a choiceless awareness, but actually turn awareness around from looking out or looking down at our thoughts 
in a dualistic way, as if there's two, there's things coming and going, there's viewing from our eyes out to the world dualistically, but turning the awareness around, back through the looker, back through the meditator, so that there is seeing without a seer, there is a experiential recognition of this dimension of consciousness which is effortlessly aware and is not located in a part. So it's not a smart part, it's not a mindful witness, it's not a kind, compassionate part, it's not an, a wise adult. As many of the psychologies say, it actually needs to even recognize that as you move from an upset part to a wise adult that has compassion for this part of you that's upset, that then you can look back through that compassionate, wise adult part to be aware of these two parts of you. So then curiously, you would ask, where are you aware from? Or who's aware of these two parts, the upset part and the compassionate part? And you can feel where the compassionate part is and its relationship as the highest aspect of the small mind or small self. But then there's a stepping beyond conditioning to this already awake consciousness, which you can be effortlessly mindful from. So this mindfulness is mindful from what's called the nature of mind. So it's mindful, but not from your managing part, and not mindful from the mindful awareness, but already mindful spontaneously from this, what I'm calling in the psychology language, self-essence, self with a capital S. So I'm using some of the language of internal family systems. Self-essence is invisible, boundless. It has no location like these other parts, but it is also equally within and all around. And when you can feel that it's not just neutral, but as it feels that it's equally inside and out and not coming and going, there's a safety, an okayness, a well-being that is profound and a relief. And this awareness then is able to recognize that the movement of vibration, sensation, aliveness, of self-energy is not other. So they're not two. So there's a primacy of this self essence or awake awareness, but then it is non-dual or not two as the same taste or one taste of awareness dancing, emptiness dancing into form that becomes self-energy. This self-energy is not a philosophy <laughs> that there'll be practices you can experience this for yourself. And this is the consciousness approach to what's been called meditation, but then it now starts coming in from space to energy to form, including the person, personalities, and these patterns, which is important because many of the traditional meditation systems try to either dissolve these patterns away as if, oh, that's just a story. Oh, if you are aware of it, you realize it's only thoughts, it's only feelings, notice how they come and go. And this is true. You can, you can watch this level of view from this particularly mindful witness, and even from effortless mindfulness, even from self-essence as it comes into self-energy. But then as you come to integrate a uh, form is emptiness, and then you start coming back, emptiness is form, then you realize this, what's called emptiness as interdependence. There's an interdependence, which means interconnectedness, that arises now as functional human creature. Not only your body, but then psychological, mental, 
you could call them mind states or subpersonalities, or they're called skandhas and kleshas, which are patterns or mind objects or personas. So this is the makeup of the human form. And so one of the most important things is that we've repressed some of these, that we've had trauma as children and as adults. There are certainly big traumas that some people have had, and there's complex trauma, which is kind of a continual painful hurts that continued over time, or one or two big traumas. And then there's what's called relational trauma, which is just both relationship to our primary caregivers, just the feeling of not being seen or being ignored or being yelled at or treated in some way that then we internalize and create a part that feels, oh, it's my fault. I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. And those parts are stuck in time and they're stuck in our bodies and bodies and psyches in that system of energy and consciousness and body. But even the best small self has a very hard time liberating because those traumatic parts, those full emotional survival energies that get caught up in feeling like this is me and I have to survive at all costs and I'll do what's necessary, whether it's depressing the energy or being anxious or aggressive or compliant or assertive or just choosing one neutral role just to go along. Uh, it suppresses all that, takes all that energy because we can't bear this healing that's needed. And so upgrading to this capacity of awake consciousness or self-essence that comes into self-energy, then comes into self-embodiment. And that's where psychology and meditation meet. Certainly, we're talking about this advanced yet simple form of meditation, which we're calling effortless mindfulness or non-dual presence that has not just a neutral witness, but when awareness comes back, when we step out of this identification, let's say, with the part of us that's listening to these words now, and just become aware of where is that located in or around your body. Usually it's an odd question because we're not used to looking for where we're usually looking from. Right? So there's the first U-turn. So you are listening to me as if I am uh, located here, talking, using words through your ears to this. Usually people feel this small thought-based me located between my ears inside of my head. And this is the point of view that you look out of if you look around the room or you listen and try to understand. So just find that thinker, that understander, that fairly important good manager. And the first thing is to say there's no bad parts, that this managing part does not need to be fought. This ego center that's usually called me is a one manager that's trying to understand, and it doesn't need to be fought or gotten rid of. It actually needs to be allowed to semi-retire from doing two jobs and working too hard. So what if you just related to this part and just gave it some sense of respect and appreciation and asked it if it could, if it could give you some space and then see whether you could step out, open up. So this is the first thing to realize this move of consciousness can be done intentionally, uniquely. The premise in this non-dual view is that this part is not doing the opening to space, this current ego is not doing it, but actually I'm talking to this self-essence or awake awareness that actually 
opens or the part relaxes its predominance to, to reveal this already awake consciousness. When you feel that move of view or this approach, this direct approach is sometimes called orientation instructions. So it's not a mental move, it's not a psychological move, it's actually location, location, location. Where are you aware from now? You're aware from the, just very casually, from the listener, from the thinker, from the understander, and now you start to shift to make what was the subject, me as the subject, feels like me, to ask for some space or let that understand or relax or open awareness to be aware where is this part located. And now the subject is recognized to be either a pattern or an object, mind object, that can be related to or a subpersonality or a part of you. Yeah? Curious, right? Then that part that's aware of it Now find out where are you located now to be aware of this small self or managing part in your head. And you might find that there's another part or another transitional subject, a location. Where's that located? And you might find a general area, maybe just the top of within your head, a little more space within your, feels like within your head or maybe a little bit out, maybe it's behind, a little above, but it usually is a point of view where a mindful witness has enough space to now be the looker, observing awareness that can be aware of that part, and if it looks closely, it will start to see that that part can also be seen as thoughts, feelings, sensations without a solid self, and it's also a subpersonality. So it's not one or the other, and it can be dissolved away temporarily, but and you, as you, if you were to get up and start to interact with other people, some part, some subpersonality would appear as at least the helpful part of the team. And so this part of you that is this me, mini-me, can be thanked and appreciated and ask to semi-retire from the job of identity as you move to this transitional view from this mindful witness, the transitional, neutral, non-judgmental witness. And then, just curiously, who's aware of those two parts? What does it feel like if you open to be aware, look back through the mindful witness, just for a few seconds? to just notice if there's a more open field. But then come on back toward the mindful witness and toward the mini-me, and then just curiously ask, how do you feel toward these two parts? And this question, when you're in this bigger field that's equally spacious and pervasive of consciousness, starts to reveal this natural positive quality, first, it can be unconditional love, which is not big burst of love, but a positive regard, seeing same, same, that we're the same. And it happens within a split second as it, oh, how do you feel? Oh, I feel love, compassion. I feel curious. But this curiosity is big, big C curiosity, not from the small self or the mindful witness. And then you can feel this big C compassion toward these parts and begin to thank this part that's been working so hard to be you and let it know that it can be part of the team, just as your hand is part of the team and your eye is part of the team and this ego function is part of the team. And then other parts that have stronger protective roles that might be fearful, it may have, or doubting, controlling, or angry, or they 
are all part of the team, and there's no bad parts. They're all trying to find love, safety, balance, connection, the best they can with their worldview. So with this new capacity, which is the key of this awake consciousness, whether you need to calm your body and mind or need to work first with the protective parts and the exiled or shadow parts in order to feel safe enough to come back or whether you can actually open up and then have the immediate capacity to work with the scared parts and traumatized parts, which I find is the key is to really find a way sooner than later to bring these two together, this awakening consciousness meditation dimensions and the psychological, physical, nervous system, breath, and relating to others and the world as we come back to work internally with these parts and then are able to look out through the eyes of this ocean of awareness that's rising as our body and these parts as part of the team that some of them are children that need some tending and they can rest or come and be understood over time so that they can feel safe and enjoy the precious human life that we have. So this is a little bit about the bringing together of the direct path awakening meditation consciousness with the contemporary psychological approach to have them work together in a way that's unique rather than it being done from the mindful mindfulness-based cognitive work or having it be kind of ego psychology based but finding this approach that isn't the only way certainly in this <laughs> field, both these fields, there's many different doorways, many different approaches, but the possibility of bringing together, you know, this ancient yet advanced direct non-dual approach to the most contemporary version of neuroscience and psychology that have been scientifically researched is a real gift to the world and feels like there is a way to learn it and teach it and to uh, work with therapists or coaches in this way and then a way to do it with a peer and then ways of doing it by yourself during the day in this small glimpses many times approach. So once you learn the, to navigate your own consciousness and learn the capacity of this loving, open-hearted presence, this heart-mind, this awake consciousness that's embodied and interconnected and has this sense of well-being and safety and can respond from here slowly, slowly, then there is a new possibility of living this third level of life, this next natural stage of human development, of awakening, or system three, or interdependent developmental consciousness, or this third way of knowing that's not only a thought-based, ego-centered way of seeing and being. So I hope you'll continue to join in this dialogue and try some of these small glimpses and learn this process of effortless mindfulness awakening training. I look forward to continuing with you, and I hope you'll join us soon. And now here's a short mindful glimpse from mini-me to self. Welcome. 
So just find a comfortable way of sitting. And today we'll explore a way to open from a small self or a managing part or an ego center to self-essence with a capital S and then self-energy, self-embodiment, and self-expression. So just begin by noticing the part that decided to sit here today and do this. The usual sense of me that has good motivation but is generally a smart part or a spiritual ego or a doer that's in pain or that has good habits of doing meditations. So without judgment, just finding this part that usually is called I or me and feel this manager, this small self that's listening. Just feel this that's looking out of your eyes, that's listening. And begin by thanking this part for all its hard work. Just sending it appreciation and acknowledging that it's been trying to be you exclusively and that you appreciate its good intentions and efforts. And then ask this part if it would give you a little more space so you can be aware of it more clearly. And so just notice soon whether you feel more space. A little bigger view. So you are now aware of this managing part more clearly from a distance as part of you. No longer being identified with it or looking out from it. But this which was the subject has now become the object, a part of you that you still can appreciate. So just appreciate this part as a part and thank it for its hard work. And now notice that you can open further. Notice where you're aware from this part and see whether that isn't a mindful witness part or a point of view or another part that's energetically connected or detached witness. See if you can feel that as a self-like part. And then thank that part for helping and ask it if it can give you some space. And then open to space. And as you open to space, just mingle awareness with space and let yourself for a few moments let go into awake space, just trusting that there's an awareness that's already aware without your help, that's been in the background, that now you can be aware as and then aware from. And when you're aware from this space, it's spacious and pervasive. It's aware of and connected to the mindful witness and see whether it's aware from and interconnected with the manager part, while remaining open. It's a unique feeling. Might feel a little 
spacious or spaced out, but just feel this more ocean of awareness, this self-essence, which is invisible, timeless, boundless, contentless, and yet awake. And then as this awareness, just notice the relationship to energy, sensation that connects back to aliveness and see whether this contentless awareness is now arising as this self-energy, which has qualities of interconnection and dynamic flow and presence. So as you're aware from this self-essence of pure consciousness to the self-energy of same taste of awareness and aliveness, just see how do you feel toward this managing part. Just take your time and feel this relationship. See whether the neutrality of the self essence and the energy start to feel qualities of curiosity or compassion, connection of a different sort. And just see whether this part of you is aware of you here with it. Just communicating with this part that's been the manager and just asking it what it's afraid would happen if it weren't in charge, in control, scanning for danger. And listen to it. This ego function that's become an ego identity, thinking it has to do all this work of being who you are in this contracted state. Now, once you hear what it's afraid of, just asking this part, what if you as this new self could come forward and it could be part of the team but semi-retire? from its role of identity. Just see how it would feel about that if it could trust that you were here now. Could respond and work with other parts. And just begin this relationship moving from the normal sense of self the small mind, ego center, managing part, to this more spacious self-essence, which arises as self-energy and now can become self-embodied through your body and just recognizing from this new sense of self, that even your body is a part of you. And the self is greater and pervasive, interconnected, but doesn't have to be identified or contracted within your body and doesn't have to be detached. Witness outside of your body. So just getting a feel for this new relationship from the spacious, energetically compassionate self with a capital S back toward that small self, which is now part, and your body, which is part of who you are. And just feeling that interconnection. And you can just Return here to this practice or 
find another glimpse during the day that's helpful. And as you transition, if your eyes are closed, they can open and look up, smile, feel that more open view that you're aware of and then aware from. Feel that embodied presence and that compassion and the ability to respond from this true nature. And as you transition, just continue to be aware from here. And during your day, just know that you can learn to return and train to remain. Enjoy. We offer this podcast freely thanks to the donations of kind listeners like you. If you'd like to be a supporter of this podcast, please visit lockkelly.org slash donate. We are grateful for your tax-deductible donations.